This is Otaku Station, broadcasting anime analysis to anyone who will listen. We have a basement archive full of an ever-growing collection of anime media. We dig deep into the great anime of the past to give you the context you need to fully appreciate the best this medium has to offer. Let's jam. Welcome to the broadcast. I hope you're having a good day wherever you happen to be right now. This is Otaku Station, where today we'll be taking a look at the original 1995 Ghost in the Shell movie. Well, the first half of it anyway. So here's how this is going to work. Uh, today we'll analyze the first half of the movie, then next time we'll look at the last half. We will have a ton to talk about, so that should break down nicely. <clears throat> And then in the broadcast after that, we'll sit down and talk through our thoughts on the movie as a whole and kind of what kind of movie it is, uh, which is surprisingly a difficult thing to nail down for a movie like this. Meanwhile, it's been a fun week. Steve is actually here at the tower, uh, spending some time here. We've been having a great time hanging out in the cafe and eating cookies and watching anime. It's great hanging out with a friend. Anyway, I wanted to give you some context about this movie and where it came from, so let's head down to the research room. Let's get behind the scenes of this movie. Now, Ghost in the Shell was originally a manga by a man named Masamuni Shiro. Now, he tended to do sci-fi action comedies that are shorter in length, only a couple of volumes long, and fairly episodic. Ghost in the Shell started out like that, a lighter action comedy set in a darker future, as you can see here. It's, uh, again, relatively light in tone, especially compared to the movie. Um, but, as it continued on around halfway through, he introduced the Puppet Master plot, which is noticeably more serious and becomes the overarching plot for the last half or so of the manga. And again, it's only one volume uh, collected, at least the version as it was when this movie was made. So you have this, again, sort of uh, sci-fi action comedy um, that exists. Now we move over to Mamoru Oshii. Uh, he got his big start on Urasai Yatsura, a sci-fi comedy. Uh, then from there, he moved on to other things, particularly Angel's Egg. Uh, and Angel's Egg is a highly symbolic, um, allegory-heavy short movie that he made in the 80s, and very dark, very thought-provoking, a uh, high art kind of a film. Um, but then other, you know, standard anime stuff um, ended up moving on to Pat Labor, which is a sci-fi action comedy. So you can kind of see where his interests are, are aligning. So then he sees Ghost in the Shell and decides to uh, adapt it. Now, production was interesting. Um, the movie had a budget of what would be a few million dollars today. The exact amount uh, is a matter of dispute. People have quoted different numbers quite different numbers um, over time, but suffice to say, it appears to have been a decent mid to higher budget budget for a non-Ghibli anime film. Moreover, as I've mentioned uh, uh, during this, they got at least some of the mo that money from Manga Entertainment, an anime licensing company in the United Kingdom. This is at a time, the 90s, when um, budgets were getting thin, the Japanese economy was going through a readjustment, shall we say, after the boom years of the 80s. So it was getting harder and harder to find money in Japan. So this was an early example of going outside Japan for some cash. And uh, apparently it worked out. Uh, now, Oshi has said he was very careful on this film. Um, there's no extra shots. Everything that was planned was put into the film, and you can see it in the animation. I'll talk about the animation in another broadcast, but it's clear that if the characters don't need to move, they don't move. There's a lot of very static shots in the film, and then they can save that budget for the high-end 
animation sequences that really pop. Uh, so despite the, or regardless of the budget, the money was very carefully spent. Uh, anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's stop there and uh, get on back up to actually watch this thing. Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. You know, with Steve here, I've just been thinking about how nice it is to spend time face to face with friends. I don't get a lot of opportunity to do that here in the tower. And there's just something about face to face, not all the time, but frequently. It, it's good. Anyway, let's get into Ghost in the Shell. Uh, watch out for how information is relayed to the audience especially in this first half of the movie. So uh, let me get Steven here and we will get John on the line. Hey John, looks like you are on. How's it going? So good, so, good so, far. so far, a little humid, a little steamy, but we got some sun coming through. So. Hey, there we go. always a good thing. Uh, well, Steve's with us here in the tower, so we're going to go ahead and dive into Ghost in the Shell 1995, original Ghost in the Shell movie. Uh, let's get into it. Notice the use of computer graphics in 1995. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and not terrible ones because they're being very thoughtful about what they're doing here, where it's clearly like a cityscape type of thing. I think it's like data, but it's yeah. all rectangles. So yeah. it's easy to render. They're not trying to render a human body or anything. I'll pause to note how iconic of a cyberpunk kind of a shot this is yeah you know person in like leather outfit s sitting on a roof you know obviously listening listening to some kind of cybernetic traffic the massive skyscrapers behind this is really setting the scene very yeah. clearly is what we're seeing there also um, feels vaguely homage to the dark knight Oh, interesting. Yes. Which came later, yeah, I mean, we know, that, you know. The, yes, yeah, yeah, the brooding kind of mm -hmm. character on the rooftop watching, watching over the scenery. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some kind of vigilante, if you, if you yes. will, perhaps, or protective. Indeed. As far as I can tell, these are drawn graphics that they have overlaid a filter onto to make it seem like it is night vision. And I'm assuming they have um, kind of two filters going there, one dark green, one light green, to get that across. Um, but because we're so zoomed out and it's so blurry, you're getting this, um, it feels like night vision. You don't have to sell it too much. Right. 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 And you, this is, you, you're, you don't you think don't there's any part of any CGI work in the background, the background of this? This is just pure I don't. I don't think so because we, we aren't seeing any movement here. It's just a okay. still image, essentially, with some jitter onto it. So there's no reason to render it in CGI. Mm, okay. um, much faster to just draw it. So what a what a cyberpunk line. Yeah. You know, your brain has a lot of noise, um, man. And again, you know the, the mega structures in the background, the wire coming out of the neck, very classic cyberpunk elements. She she's jacked in. She's jacked in exactly. I'm in. Um. And then we get the line that they, uh, they changed. Must be a loose wire. Yeah. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, being on, on, on her period didn't really fly. The idea, I think, though, in the original is that, I mean, A, they're playing around with biology versus cybernetics, right? That the, your, right. your physical body can interfere with the electronic signals. Um, um, but then also just kind of playing around with, because here's the thing, she can't be. Right. She can't possibly she have one of those. Yeah. So how much is she joking with that? It's kind of interesting. Well, are they, are they with her jacked in and noise in her brain sort of, thing, are they trying to establish more of her humanity in it? So even oh, by wait. stating that, yeah. even though it's she, she physically can't, mm -hmm. but by saying that it's like, no, I'm still a person. I still right. have, you know, the, 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 the biological capability in my mind. I, yeah. I think it's I more, know. well, Bato and, and the Major's relationship is quite interesting. Yeah. So I think this might mm. be just unit banter. Inter True. Inter inter mm. Yeah. Banter. Yeah. They're, they're just, they're, they're joking <clears throat> around with each other. Yeah. Yeah. I, I right. get that too. Um, and, and her kind of screwing around with his knowledge of her. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. Right. right. 
So thinking about the, A, the physicality of that in contrast to the kind of digital nature of the communication, that like you have to physically pull the wires out, but then the idea that that's, that's not good, that you're... <laughs> So one of the one of the tropes in cyberpunk when you're dealing with something like like necromancer or jo George Alexander's um, mm. character Marid Odran who's who can plug software into his head, <coughs> they, all the common tropes they of this is just like you carefully mm. pull it out. You don't yeah. just you just don't rip it out because that yeah. can cause problems. Yeah. So we're we're seeing here kind of a sort of a an example of bad assery. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just like you yeah. know, ah, just pull it out. Yeah, ah, that hurt a little bit, but okay, no worries. Yep. Mm -hmm. well, also, also, given the time period, those are AV cords. True. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Um, also, She's perhaps got an the ECR strapped to her back. <laughs> <laughs> also, perhaps the implication that she is so advanced that doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, anything that would happen in there, she has enough shields and things to deal with. And I, and I think this is also another example of Oshi just go, making us a detail. Yeah. It's Oshi, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For something that we're bringing forth there. Yeah, um, uh, giving us the detail of connection. True. And severing mm -hmm. that connection because that's yeah. that would be electrical. That would be because yeah. we would think of computers as electrical at this time and True. things like that. So yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. That's a great point. Um, also, let's be honest. Cool visual. Yes. Right. <laughs> so there's that as well. You know. All right. So a lot being communicated <clears throat> here already. Mm -hmm. The idea that this is section nine and that they can kind of um, go beyond their remit because they're trusted to resolve any problems that show up. Right. Um, so even though they're clearly some, you know, you're not a gang called Section 9. You know, this is clearly some well-funded organization. And not only that, like, you can go pretty far with what you do. Section nine in in this universe is a is a legitimized um, government sanctioned dark operations unit. Mm. So section six is if you read the the, yeah. the manga, they are an actual above the, the the regular police, but they have rules that they have to follow mm -hmm. and they, that they can't deviate from. They're almost like a SWAT uh, team. Same, yeah, 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 yeah. And the and section nine is more along the lines of. You know, everything's going to be okay as long as we get the thing done. Mm -hmm. So, what, however we get to that point, yeah. kind of doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so, are they kind of like cleaners that they come in and do the sort of dirty kind of work work after yeah. Section yeah. 6? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, note here the <coughs> detail given to the gun. Mm -hmm. um, that this is not a Star Wars blaster. You know, it is very clearly a modern style firearm. Yeah. Uh, so again, sort of grounding us in the reality of this. And yeah, iconic shot. Yeah, iconic scene here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, she's wearing a bodysuit, Brent, so it's, it's, sure. it's fine. You can see right. it. Right. Like absolutely, <coughs> yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, tell YouTube that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, to your point, not only an iconic shot, you think of the what we're seeing here. Yeah, we're looking down on the streets. But it is, it's all of these giant buildings that are ringing this, this sort of roundabout here. Um, so reinforcing not only the idea of cyberpunk, but also to get a little, you know, um, over the top, being hemmed in by civilization, right? That you're getting ringed right. around by all this, and you can't escape that. Um, and the major's about to literally dive right into it. Another iconic moment. Yep, another iconic moment. <laughs> also important because she's smiling. You know, she just dived off this thing, so she clearly knows what she's doing. Um, um, but then also the wide open eyes helps to make it a little unreal. You know, who would right. who would do that? Um, clearly, somebody who is a little more than human. So they're giving us kind of a POV shot here by um, panning along this background, right? Um, as it goes, goes in the shell. A lot of, not, a lot of, not a lot of folks know that every dollar of budget is on screen. Yeah. They did not have a huge budget for this movie. They just <clears> made <throat> it, you know, the action scenes are fantastic because they made it sure to put money, money into it. But um, as I said, uh, Oshi has said, uh, the reason you never see any cut shots from Ghost in the Shell, because there weren't any. We didn't have right. time to do any more than what we actually had. Um, for this shot, we pan up to this for maybe a quarter of the fall. 
and then very quickly shoots, shoots back to uh, to uh, uh, the major because presumably they didn't have the, the money <laughs> to do the entire fall, right. you know, which you yeah. would have if you were thinking of doing, okay, we're going to see him go all the way down. Nope, just, eh, just enough to give us the idea and then cut away. We're also seeing here some sense of budget in the number of characters, all of whom animated differently. It's not just copy and paste right. characters. So, okay, we can handle a, a crowd scene. So notice how many things just happened. Right. Um, a, the bodyguards figured out what was happening with no dialogue. Um, they immediately readied their weapons. They immediately fired on police, which apparently they shouldn't have done. Um, police, then we do not get a gunfight. Right. The police just swarm in and the guy <clears throat> surrenders. So, so much political maneuvering happening right off the bat. Yeah. All right, so got to ask the question, why the aquarium? Because it gives more action to the scene, to the scene, I guess. That helps. Yeah. Um, you could also argue it is getting across the idea of folks swimming in politics or swimming in in this situation that you're they're literally trying to like swim against the stream or with the stream. Mm -hmm. um, that they're just you know. Um, trying to get by in this huge, you know, environment. So again, a bunch of things happen here. First off, we hear the major. Then we see the guy's head explode, let's be honest. Um, yeah. And head explodes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> down to the spinal column. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. No, I was going to say that, and that is very much intentional because they understand why if this guy gets away, then whatever is whatever secrets are being yeah. handled are going to be exposed a certain somebody somewhere doesn't want that yep and if you're dealing with cybernetic and uh, cybernetic individuals what's the only real part of them left mm -hmm. it's their brain yep mm -hmm. and um regardless in this society if you can jack into people and get information off of their brains right. the brain can't survive right yeah, yeah. yeah exactly um but then also the fact that this happens and immediately the other guy goes, shoot the window. Like, he knows exactly what's happening here. here. Yeah. yeah. I know it's graphic, friend, but yeah. when he pops like a, like a uh, <laughs> balloon, he's got a lot of wiring. Yeah. He does. You're absolutely right. You know, like, the only thing apparently of him that is, like, human was the brain part. The rest of it is tubes and wires and things. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great point. Absolutely right. Again, iconic shot. <laughs> yes. Yep. Kind of shot we can show. Yay. Cloaking. Cloaking. Yeah. Yeah. Cloaking. yeah. Cloaking. Note what they're doing here, though, also. That's like TV static. Um, yeah. And it's clearly using, uh, like, interference signals from a television and so forth with the, the multicolor to get this across, uh, which is a relatively inexpensive way of doing that, where you just sort of take a video signal and then filter that and cut it out and so forth. Very smart for them to do. And then the implication there, where again, she, to your point about her loving her work, she's smiling, looking straight at them. Yeah. Yep. yep. She wants them to know. Yep, exactly. In that sequence, what we see here is mm. um, her saying to them, basically, yeah. you screwed up, and I'm here to fix it, and we knew, more, more importantly, we knew you were going to screw up. Yes, great point. And so that's mm -hmm. that's why we do why we do what we do, mm -hmm. and there's nothing you can do about it. Yep. Now, in case the green on black <clears throat> looks familiar, <laughs> um, it's because the Wachowskis, when they were making Ghost, in the, uh, making uh, the Matrix, Matrix. Um, they showed this movie to their um, martial arts and special effects people and said, "We want it to look like that." And so the iconic green things coming down in the Matrix were very much inspired by yeah. this. Hmm. Also note the pixelization of the logo, um, which then resolves into crisp, you know, anti-aliased images, which again you could argue is the idea of the digital turning real, right. which is right. a thing that happens. Also an English title. Yeah. Like this is, this is the original official title for this, and it's all in English. So here's digital, right? Clearly a CG of a brain scan and then a rectangle moving through it. 
and, and I love the, 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 the point of this whole sequence, which mm. is to explain cybernetics without having to go into a 50-minute, <laughs> here's right. what this is, folks. <laughs> here's, here's what, what we, we discovered, discovered in the year, year blah, blah, blah. blah. Mm -hmm. um, which is literally what they did in uh, the original Westworld. Yeah. If you remember, there, there's the scene where they're in like the, the robot repair bay. Yeah. And they're walking past all the things. And they say, well, here's how the robots work. It's like, uh -huh. Also, I just got to say, um, I feel so bad for the animators. Imagine trying to figure out how all of these parts move. Yeah. Right? And how that, that would actually move down there. What are the three dimensionalities of that when that moves in? What is going to look like? They had to, like, this does not exist. It's not like animating a person. Right. You have to imagine it in your head and then draw it. Oh. I love this scene coming up. Yeah. Um, you also get a sense of the scale of the operation, mm -hmm. right? That it's, it's not really assembly line. Uh, you right. have to do these different steps, and somebody has to watch it happen, and there's all of this quality control implied. There's no explanation for how it's floating in space. Good point. Right? The body is literally just levitating, apparently. Um, it is possible that there is something going on with, uh, like these, these are different liquids. That, that's the explanation, is that yeah. she's going, rising from one liquid into another, and okay. now she's into a... Just a, a, a yeah. transparent liquid. Yeah. yeah. A but series of magnets. magnets. <laughs> <laughs> How do they work? Um, yeah. but yeah, no, and there, there is that, but, but it, it does give this supernatural sensation to it. Like, right, yeah. like, like, like this is some body that is being raised by a god you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, for in some ritual. And to your point about um, skipping details, you don't know how the hair comes in. Right. It's just there. Yeah. 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 Fine. Fine. <laughs> we accept. Yeah. <laughs> and there goes the gel coat. Yep. Mm-hmm. Another iconic shot. Um, also, again, somebody had to draw every single fleck of paint on that. Uh, and to your, this, to your point, now we're seeing the Transparent yeah, liquid, so we know. The amniotic fluid, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Like, amniotic fluid. It is a very birthing moment. Yeah. And this is an important point. One of the reasons why we are seeing so much English is that this is produced by Kananja uh, with Bandai Visual and Manga Entertainment. That was an American anime licensing company. Ooh. Um, okay. That is like, you know, in association with Funimation or Crunchyroll. They put money into this. They were British, I believe. Um, they put money into this for this to be made because they knew it would, would do well, uh, which is one of the reasons why it's been in print continually because they own a piece of this. Wow. They're literally part of the production committee that made Ghost in the Shell. This begs the obvious question. Was she dreaming? Do robots Watch dream electric dreams? dreams? Yeah, right. Um, like the, the implication here is that she was just dreaming of her birth, um, except she wouldn't have remembered that necessarily. Right, because her brain's not in, in it there. Yet. Right, yeah. Um, now, I believe there was a version of Ghost in the Shell, um, one, one of the variations where she watched, you know, a younger version of herself watches this version being made. So she's, you know, on the deck watching this body which yeah, he's later installed into yeah um oh okay. that could happen i don't know also, she's crying she's crying yeah um i want to call it it's that called out. leaking optical, optical fluid yes <laughs> <laughs> but you note the very human gesture there right yeah. after all of that very mechanical processing just that you know just feels much more like a person boy if that isn't a shot yeah, it's beautifully framed. Absolutely. Um, also contrasting, you know, her being literally a shadow compared to the city, compared to civilization. She is this small thing, surrounded by all of the, this giant technology, um, and also kind of womb-like, right? Where she's in her womb right now. The visual impact where that sunlight coming in that window should illuminate the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. True. You get the door opening where she's gone to the next room, and all you get is that, you know, sort of like key light on yeah. the floor. It does not illuminate anything mm -hmm. in the room. Yep, exactly. Shoot. 
yeah. which you know is that sort of is that sort of giving you the idea that inside she's in a dark place mm-hmm. you know that the rest of the world's out there and this is her yeah. interior kind of thing going on where it's like it's all dark and brooding yeah mm-hmm. um also i think establishing a noir aesthetic mm. uh, as if they didn't yeah. need to but you know <laughs> adding the flashing light that's another artistic element that you have to add over it and you know have it come in and out um, repeatedly. Um, so it's just another little thing that you have to make sure is in there. So, and again, think of the framing of this. Important per- looking person gets off the <clears throat> helicopter. There's a man at the foot of the stairs looking up at him, looking annoyed. Yeah. You know, okay, we know something's gonna happen here. For all of what we said before about creativity and use of everything, this is just dialogue in an elevator. Yeah. <laughs> it is pure info dump with a background just slowly going up in the back. <laughs> like it's yeah. It's it's a it's a very but it's a very cost efficient way of getting information across to the viewer. So sometimes you gotta do it. Getting across a few things about Aramaki here. First, he's never happy. Um <laughs> <laughs> but second also always thinking so we have a sense of this character already so i do really appreciate the little element of all the high tech plus the acupuncture <laughs> i just noticed that i'm like what are all the little antennas oh. yeah um and and i remember there being some implication somewhere that those like go into specific like slots in the brain case for some reason you know like yeah. there, there's a literal reason you know electronically those go in there but it's just a little east meets west detail. Yeah. Again, we have to notice the combination of things going on here. Uh, the all the wires leading out of the the, the brain. Um, the other brain <laughs> that's sitting there on the table, but also the pumping of the one pipe, the sound yeah. of the heartbeat. Like there's clearly a human body here that's being kept alive in addition to all of the electronic brain stuff going on. He just had a conversation with the head of the foreign ministry, and the foreign ministry is talking about stuff that he probably already knows because he's got the guy's gavel's interpreter right there. Didn't tell That's the a foreign great point. minister what's going on. So he's trying to figure out if the foreign minister knows anything. That was that was Aramaki clearing the foreign minister of any wow. wrongdoing. Yeah. Mm. That's fascinating. That's a that's a great point. Yeah, they got this 23 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Notice the rear uh, facing camera mm-hmm. up front, um, which they had to animate. <laughs> um, another another detail there, um, but also note like the multiple layers here. You have the traffic out the front window. You have <clears throat> um, Ishikawa. Ishikawa? No. Oh, no, Tokusa. Tokusa. Thank you. Uh, driver's seat. You have the major in the back doing her thing. So a lot going on just in this one shot for a very quiet scene. Mm -hmm. It's just dialogue for her to explain to Togusa what's going on. Yeah, we could have gone with the elevator type of uh, schmear where it was them just facing forward and nothing else, you know, sort of going on. Yeah, it could have been like a shot of Togusa in the the van, right? Like face front. And then just a shot of her from the front you know, without anything moving around her, you know, a lot easier. Again, this is not Aramaki talking. This is not the head of the group talking. This is the grunts on the ground, so to speak. And they're having to think three moves ahead as to who's doing what for why and so forth. Right. Right, so important thesis here, uh, the importance of diversity. Um, The idea that you need a variety of opinions, a variety of perspectives. In a highly technologized society, there becomes fewer and f- there less and less variety, mm. right? So this is kind of pointing out that as the society has gotten more uh, technologically advanced, there are dangers there in, beco- in groupthink, basically. And she's also pointing out that the fact that he is so low cybernetic mm. That and one of the reasons why that they can trust him is because he's not likely to get hacked. Yeah. 
his mm-hmm. systems can't get hacked. He's, he's almost entirely still human. Yeah. And so they don't have to worry about that thing within their system. It's, it's like ba- basically if you have a problem with a mole, it's kind of nice to know not the one guy <laughs> that we know. You know, there's at least one guy mm-hmm. we know it's not going to be that, that, yep. that person mm-hmm. um, that can be taken over like that. Yep. <clears throat> but it also, you know, it's, it, the thing about Togusa it, it, throughout this whole thing is that mm. he's kind of the foil to the major in yeah. talking about technology and man and mm-hmm. where those lines go and yeah. where, what he's willing to do. It's also interesting that she calls out the fact that he's married. Yeah. Because for most cops, that's a liability. Yeah. Right? But for this, it means you're human. Right. Which is kind of interesting. Again, somebody had to draw all that. Yeah. yeah. Yeesh. They're freaking out about being 40 seconds behind schedule, which it ties back very to that. Japanese. Very Japanese. Very Japanese. Um, but also that idea of, you know, hyper-specialization, hyper-technologized, everything's tracked down to the second. Um, but, but then also, other guy isn't wearing his mask. Yeah. So the human can always, you know, circumvent or, or just ignore <laughs> what, what quote-unquote should be done. He slides the chip in or slides the card in, takes his hand away, and then it automatically slides to the side. I think the implication here is that 10 years ago on these machines, you had to physically slide them, and then somebody installed a little motor to move them along so you wouldn't have to right. do that. Right? So this, this idea of this technology has been upgraded, this terminal has been upgraded over time to change how things are, because if it always had that motor, it wouldn't need the arrow. Right. 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 So, neat little thing. Um, actually, another thing, we talked before about um, the internationalization of anime, how they tend to make things so that they are um, easy to understand internationally. Phone! Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's not suspicious. Hi, I'm a Nigerian <laughs> prince. Yeah. I need your help. Yeah. Give me your information. I'll put in a few million dollars, and I'll take it back out and leave you a couple million. You'll know, be fine. You'll be fine. But he yeah. was so nice. Hey, buddy, I'm so nice, buddy. He, he heard, heard my, my sob story. story. <laughs> Does that help me out of the goodness of his heart? <laughs> sure. <laughs> that kind of said that would hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, perhaps no pain receptors. Oh, oh man. It is yeah. Jack. Yeah. So, again, CGI shot here. Uh, relatively straightforward. It is, you know, extruded rectangles basically on on a green grid. Um, I'm assuming, given the imagery, it should be pointed out that's not an actual map, um, right. because there's you know it, it's all connected straight lines or curves. There's no inner you know the, nothing breaks in any of the streets. Like it seems a little bit too much, um, but somebody did a really good job of making it seem like streets. We've had a lot of very straightforwardly animated scenes up to this point. Um, very clear where, whatever. This is full frame animation. Every single drawing is taking up the almost the entire screen. Um, so they're, and this is again Oshii being smart. This is saying, action scene begins now, and now we're using more detailed CGI, so more complex shapes on the buildings just when we zoom in to have basically just two buildings in the shot. So, again, uh, clever use of money. Now, here's another indication that things are not what they seem. Um, If you realize the cops are after you, is your first instinct, I have to go back to the guy who got me in trouble trouble. Yeah. to warn him. Like, hmm, no. No. And again, I love the detail that it's another trash pickup point. Right. Yeah. That, that, you know, that they're, they're going past, and, and this guy is obviously like, oh, i got to take care of something. And again, see what Oshii is doing here. We're in the middle of this high-stakes sequence. Um, trash truck zips around the corner, and we hold on the guy's face, letting us know processing, processing, thinking. Um, this is so brilliant in a sequence like this because... The audience now is now thinking, what's he going to do? That's what he does. Yes. <laughs> Pull a gun. Pull a gun and start shooting. And the implication of the previous shot is that, you know, 
he realizes it's, it's not just taking out the, the trash truck, it's whoever's following the trash truck. Notice their facial expressions in this shot. Um, their van just turned onto its side. They just blew open the glass. It's a normal day in the office. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're just getting into work here. We pause for him to get out the gun and then settle. Yeah. It's like, why is he He's settling? settling. What, what? He's definitely setting to fire a more powerful ammunition because before he just yeah. sort of made little tiny holes and those mm. are rounds large enough to dent the truck before yeah. they blew it up. Exactly. Um, but you'll also notice Togusa and uh, the Major are going away from him. Right. Yeah. yeah. They didn't exit and try to engage him immediately. As soon as this happened, they're like, <laughs> you know, immediate engagement, not the best choice of action. Bato's so, got the eyes for this. Yeah, but yep. but more important, uh, not more importantly, but the yeah. dog in the background is... is kind of <laughs> yep, the Basset Hound. The Always got to have a Basset Hound in a she film. Um, but yeah, no, uh, to your point, normal people can't see this clearly, but presumably with Bato's eyes, he's able yeah. to detect that he's there. Um, also needs to be pointed out, just the, again, that theme of... Um, everything being the same is, is a problem. But your posters, everything is the same. So we're, we're repeating that, that motif. Another example of anime's love of jumping. Yes. yes. Uh, everyone can always jump 30 feet from a standstill. And we have it again here in Ghost in the Shell. There's an important detail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> she jumps down and literally dents this heavy metal frame. She's not heavy. That was a very weak panel. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, they even go out of the way to 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 draw in like the the reinforced beams below. Below it, yeah. yeah. Right. That is not just a flat panel. It's like whoa. And again, just clever use of camera work, where you don't know where he's gone, and you're like, oh, uh. hundreds of people. <laughs> Sukiji Market. What do you know? Yeah. Uh huh. Absolute worst place he could have gone for the cops to trail him. Again, getting back, this is a very expensive set, set of shots here. Um, got people moving back and forth all the time. And uh, for most of these shots, the camera is not just flat on. It's like looking up. So you have all these weird angles on the people. Um, but the point of this sequence is, where's Waldo? Um, right. And so you need lots of movement for the eye to constantly be moving around to see, can I find him? Can I see him in, the, in this sequence? Is that him? Far right? I don't know. Could I don't be. know. Could be. Hard to tell. Looks kind of like him. Could be. And again, that could have been added literally. I, I, I'm not showing it very very well. Um, I, I was. Never mind. Um, that, that could have been added literally as a reward for a viewer who managed to notice it. it. Yeah. Even though it's not necessarily him. But it's just that we're supposed to look for. And what are we seeing here? Slow motion. So Bato is able to do something to change his image processing. And definitely knocking people out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually an important point, that in many ways, you know, sometimes Section 9 does as much damage as the criminals do. The thing to point out here about Bato, he's not just shooting these because he has a clear shot. It's also wet fruit that can splatter onto the thermoptic camouflage and possibly make it visible. So, why are they holding on this for so long? Because um, they loved Urasayatsu, a beautiful dreamer, and they wanted to emphasize the puddle of water reflection. <laughs> thousand percent. Um, I mean, it is the same director. Yeah. Um, but, um, yes. Now that you've said <laughs> yeah. that, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's like, I, actually, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, um, but in addition to that, um, I think, that, again, there's that sense of tension and relief, or release. The idea that we've had this long action sequence, and now he's trying to figure out what's happened. What's going on? What should he do next? And there's been no further pursuit of him into this area. So he's trying to figure out, have I been tailed? Have I, have I gotten rid of them? Um, 
but also I think it gets the audience a chance to catch its breath and to get a sense of this new environment. Um, also odd because we've been moving away from technology this entire time. And so now we're in this very rundown area. You notice the construction cranes, though. So this idea is probably going to get demolished and reconstructed at some point. Well, when I brought up, say, Kowloon City, is yeah. that, that was the city in China that built up instead of out. Mm -hmm. And that's where, like, a lot of rules don't apply. Mm. So there's a lot of, <clears throat> there was no law in Kowloon City. There was mm. no, no authority in city mm -hmm. so he's running into a place of that that is basically lawless mm -hmm. and he's and it's you notice it's very quiet and he's just kind of he's trying to escape but he's finding himself on the ground and not up yeah true you know yeah and i guess the implication is because there's no one around it must be condemned yeah mm -hmm. and again you think what possessed oshi to say we have to animate the bridge overhead like, that's a very expensive right. shot. But it gives that sense of being in a confined space and then breaking free into this much more open space. Well, it also feels like they saved on him running from the waist down. True. Yeah. So that you could get this yeah. sort of distraction overhead where you're like, damn, look at the bridge and his light movement yeah. without having to fully animate every single step. Yep, you're right. So, <clears throat> more to the point, he sees this mm. plane mm -hmm. that's so close. Yeah. And he's looking for escape. Yep. Exactly. Um, also, again, to be very, you know, over analytical, but it is a little technology over us, you yeah. know, um, inescapable ceiling of technology. That's just a single frame that they're just zooming out on and pulling back on. And it works. Like, I'm not complaining. It's just fascinating how simple that is and how effective it is. It's also notable how they're doing this for a character who we have no idea who this is. Yeah. Um, we don't know his motivations or anything else like that. So flipping the script and making us wonder what he's doing and why he's doing and really focusing on him gives us more kind of mental space to wonder around the plot of who this guy is. He comes out, he sees this wide open space, we know he's in water, he hears a thing, he sprays bullets. We know how many bullets he has left. Yeah. Not enough so we, to waste them. Yep. So we know that's probably pretty much all of his bullets right there. What a shot. Mm-hmm. Brilliant use of the little ripples. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and her shadow in the water and that instantaneous flicker of her body. Not just that, the fact that she just kicked his tail and she is standing completely erect. Yep. You know? She, like, this is nothing for her. I had to realize the shades were wired in. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that either. I hadn't realized that until now. Um, so, presumably that would have given him some kind of, you know, great, like, Bato's eyes. Would have given mm -hmm. him some kind of advantage. Yeah. That now, this is the last act of a desperate man. Yeah. His shades are off. He knows there's somebody using optical camel camouflage, and there's... What can you do? You just pull a knife and you're just yeah. winging it. Mm -hmm. And also to note, why did he pull the knife? Like, why didn't he say, I give up? This is a shot, this is a move from a fighting game. Uh, so, Oshi at the time was playing, I'm going to get the name of, the, of it wrong, so I'm not going to remember what it is, but you know, Fatal Fury or one, one of the, the big games. And if you go Street back, Fighter. yeah, uh, one of the characters has this move, and it's exactly this move. And he said, literally, like, we got to this shot, we needed something cool, and I said, make it look like this. And they made it look like that. <laughs> <laughs> Note what's happening here. She's moving in slow motion, he's not. Isn't that the controlled, like, um, kung fu kind of move, where it's like, you smash the guy, then you slow, mm -hmm. like, haw. Yeah. <laughs> I think Bruce, Bruce Lee did that in some of his, sure. um, some of his films, where he'd do the quick snaps, mm -hmm. and then the other guy would go fly, and then he would just kind of mm -hmm. settle yeah, yeah. Like, good point. Interesting dichotomy here. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's talking about he's a human as if as if Bato himself is separate from him. True. Right. Yeah. Superior to being a human, but what mm. does he do with for the major? Yeah. Puts mm. his coat around. Mm. Her. Yeah. It's a very. It, the idea that he's concerned with her modesty when she isn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fascinating thing there. 
Well, she's wearing a bodysuit. You can see it right on the neck, the neckline. Sure. Uh huh. Yeah. It's just a really tight bodysuit. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to call out how funny it is looking back on this that they start recording, and it's totally a VCR. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was cutting tech back then. Exactly. Yeah. Notice how world weary he is. Yeah. You know, he's about to engage in this raid for this major political, you know, um, and criminal target. And so proceed. Yeah, he's already figured out that he's not going to get what he wants, but you know, mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's going through the motions. Yeah. Mm. Although, also to point that out, the, you know, general theme of <clears throat> who's a puppet and who isn't, who's mm -hmm. real, who isn't, um, he's very much acting like a robot here, right, like a puppet. Your entire literal life is a literal lie. Yeah. And they can't undo it. Mm hmm Yeah. This little scene gives us the stakes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, also establishes what's possible in this world. Uh, not a lot of writers, not a lot of mangaka and so forth, are willing to go this whole hog on the implications of a technology to say that they can just hack into your brain and completely change your memories at will um, as much as they want to. Yeah. Uh, that's bad. Um, and then we have here the major looking through a window. Um, um, so she is looking through a mediate experience to something else, you know, that symbology there. Uh, and then presumably also thinking about, okay, I'm partly artificial. How much of me is real? I do want to call out here something I appreciate about the English dub of here, of this. The previous line was, no matter how much um, uh, information is minuscule, they change it to just a drop in the bucket. Because the next scene is them in the ocean. Mm. And it's just like, eh, nicely done. Yeah, the Major is going to need one hell of a buoyancy device for if she weighs as much as she's indicated to weigh. Yep. Like, oh, she'd sink like a stone. <clears throat> exactly. Yep. Look at what she's trying to replicate, though. Hmm. <clears throat> the dream. Yeah. That's true. Um, it's very much like her creation. Yeah. Yeah. I have to call out how hard this is to have two images that are getting close to each other and then to have one ripple at the point where she touches it and then to continue to ripple out effectively. That's not a filter. Somebody is literally drawing each of those smears out to look like a ripple of the body. It's mind-blowing. I have to say, yep. Richard Epcar really does make a really good angry human being. He does, yes. <laughs> he, he, he knew how to do this role. Also interesting how um, she doesn't strip in front of him, right? She does go off to the side, but she also doesn't close the door. <laughs> you also think about how little green we've seen so far in this mm -hmm. movie. You know, we're always in the middle of this hyper city. So this isn't happening in the same reality as the other shots, right? Like this sequence, th this shot. Those buildings weren't that close unless they drifted real far real quick. Yeah. Um, so we're suddenly kind of in the characters' heads in here. No, it was not. No, it was not. Um, <laughs> also Skynet's got a weird voice. Yeah. Well, and you notice, where is she looking? Back, to yeah. Go back towards the city, right? Back towards that giant blue background that we were looking at before, that sense of technology. So I hated this sequence when I first watched it. Um, because it didn't seem to be doing anything. It seemed to be a, a bunch of shots of different characters, the major maybe seeing herself, so forth and so forth. <clears throat> I didn't understand this is not meant to necessarily be literally what the major is doing here. I think it is. But this is symbolic of what's going on in her head. Right? She sees somebody else that looks exactly like her in a window, partly because she is not necessarily a unique 
model of cyborg. Right. So there may be multiples of her physically in the world, which makes you think, you know, when you're out here. But this is all the major's internal world, really, um, being represented through the real world she's going through, basically. Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. We'll stop it right there. There's just so much to go into with Ghost in the Shell. We'll come back next time with the second half of the movie and dive into that. So that'll do it for today. Thank you for watching, and until next time, watch more anime.